So our next panel of the morning is moderated by Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, whom, as I mentioned earlier, has been a godsend to me in helping to plan this conference and also helped introduce our movie last night because she's a featured, uh, <laughs> featured player <laughs> in the movie. Um, Admiral Phillips is an independent consultant working on resiliency and climate impact on national security. A surface warfare officer, she has served in every warfare group of the surface Navy, destroyers, aircraft carriers, amphibious and replenishment ships. During her 31 years on active duty, she commissioned and commanded USS Mustin and commanded Destroyer Squadron 28 and Expeditionary Strike Group 2, which included all the amphibious expeditionary forces on the east coast of the United States, which is quite a task. Ashore, she was a senior fellow on the CNO's Strategic Studies Group 28 and managed requirements and resources for the Surface Navy as Deputy Director and Director of Surface Warfare Division in the Pentagon. From 2009 to 12, she served on the Chief of Naval Operations Climate Change Task Force and Energy Task Force, where she co-chaired the Surface Force Working Group, developing and implementing climate change adaptation and energy reduction strategies for the Navy. In addition, she has served overseas in Guam and Lisbon, Portugal, and operated extensively with NATO and Partnership for Peace Nations. Upon retirement from the Navy in 2014, she pursued her MBA at the College of William & Mary, so she's also a lady of taste and distinction. Uh, Mason School of Business, graduating in 2016. During this time, she also chaired the Infrastructure Working Group for the Hampton Roads Sea Level Rise Preparedness and Resilience Intergovernmental Pilot Planning Project, which was an intergovernmental initiative to develop a whole of government approach to sea level rise preparedness in Hampton Roads. She continues to work to address sea level rise and climate impact on national security at the regional, state, and national level, and has served as a panelist and speaker to a broad range of audiences. She also serves on local, regional, and national nonprofit boards, including the advisory board for the Center for Climate and Security. Please welcome Admiral Ann Phillips. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for your timely return from break so we can uh, kick off our second panel here. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, the College of William and Mary and Elizabeth and uh, Professor Andrews and her staff in particular for putting on a great conference today. And also to thank our early speakers who really set the stage for, I think, what this panel is going to talk about, and in particular, the previous panel uh, sponsored by Colonel Olson for uh, a terrific kind of series of introductory uh, commentary and opportunity talking about what is available to us here in this region, what we should be thinking about in the context of resiliency and how we can move forward. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, just a few brief opening remarks. This panel is intended to discuss national security and policy issues, so you heard some of what is happening on the ground now. We're thinking of what is in the context of uh, from those who are currently working policy within the Department of Defense and those who have worked policy within the Department of Defense and continue to pursue such implementation from externally, um, what are the next steps and what do we need to do to further develop resiliency measures? particularly within a region like ours, where nearly 40% of our economy, our greater economy, is in some way attached to or a factor of the, the large federal presence here. Two thirds of that federal presence is Department of Defense, three quarters of that is Navy. And as you've heard other, other uh, speakers mention this morning, in addition to what is arguably the largest naval base in the world, we have the only aircraft carrier construction facility in the country right here in Hampton Roads, the only aircraft carrier refueling facility right here in Hampton Roads, one of only two submarine construction facilities, the fifth largest container port, and you'll hear more about that later today from Kit Shope, who is here, uh, a significant Coast Guard presence, their largest training facility, fifth district, Atlantic Area Commander, NASA Langley and Jefferson Labs, just to show you the diversity of what's actually here. Many of you know this, but sometimes you don't take it all in the context of what's actually here. Many of you are also aware of the considerable work that has been done statewide and in this region, particularly this year under the Go Virginia uh, Commonwealth Project, looking at ways to revitalize and uh, expand the economy across the state of Virginia and in particular in this region. 
I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that unless we understand and get our hands around and develop a plan for how we are going to deal with climate impact on this region and more broadly throughout the state, and in reality at a national level, much of that economic resilience work, which is so timely and so thoughtfully in, in underway, will be wasted. So let's think about this in the context of how we can move forward at the, at the federal, state, and local level and talk a little bit with our panel this morning about national security and policy issues required to make that more feasible. I'll introduce all of the speakers at first so that they can each then proceed through their opening remarks. And then um, I have questions if you don't have questions, but we'd love to have a dialogue between you and the speakers so that we can really get to the heart of some of this information. So first, we are honored to be joined this morning by Ms. Maureen Sullivan. She is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Environment, Safety, and Occupational Health and the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy, Installations, and the Environment. She's responsible for the Department of Defense's policies and programs related to compliance with environmental law, and this is a very large portfolio, so stand by. I think you should hear it. Management of natural and cultural resources, cleanup of contaminated sites, safety and occupational health, fire and emergency services and installation emergency management, green and sustainable building infrastructure, international environment compliance and cleanup efforts, climate change adaptation planning, strategic sustainability planning, planning to address emerging contaminants, and international defense environmental cooperation. Ms. Sullivan is also responsible for the Department of Defense Native American Program and is the Department of Defense Federal Preservation Officer representing the Secretary of Defense on the President's Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, an item near and dear to our world here in the Hampton Roads region. Her total DOD career spans 37 years. She's worked in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Defense Logistics Agency, focused on environmental activities and pollution prevention. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Economics from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Our second speaker will be Dr. Rear Admiral David Titley, a professor of practice in meteorology and professor of international affairs at the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Titley is the founding director of Penn State Center for Solutions to Weather and Climate Risk. He is a Penn State graduate and after graduating, served in the Navy for 32 years, rising to the rank of Rear Admiral, where for his penultimate tour, he commanded, well, his, his ultimate tour, the uh, Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command, and ocean, was oceanographer and navigator of the Navy. Also while serving in the Pentagon, he initiated and led the Navy's Task Force on Climate Change. I worked for him there in the Surface Force Working Group, and I did what he said, and that was a good thing. <laughs> After retiring, Dr. Titley has served as the Director, the Deputy Undersecretary for, of Commerce for Operations, which is the Chief Operating Officer position for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He is the recipient of an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, serves on the boards of the National Academy of Science and many others, and is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Finally, Brigadier General Bob Barnes, United States Army retired, a senior policy advisor and member of the advisory board for the Center for Climate and Security. General Barnes provides policy advice on addressing the national and international security implications of climate change. He's a recognized expert on environmental security, interagency and public-private collaboration on climate change and other environmental matters with national security implications. He retired from the Army in 2001. His last assignment was as Assistant Judge Advocate General for Civil Law and Litigation. He's also held many other Judge Advocate General positions, one of the more interesting and unique being legal advisor to Joint Task Force Olympics. Following his retirement from the Army, General Barnes participated in a two-year MIPT and Kennedy School study of balancing security and civil liberties, and served as a consultant to the World Bank on ethics and integrity. From 2002 to 2014, he served as senior policy advisor for the Nature Conservancy, focusing on national security implications of conservation and energy policy. Welcome to all of our distinguished panelists, and uh, our first speaker will be Ms. Maureen Sullivan. Thank you. Th 
Thank you, Ann. Um, and uh, it's an honor to be here. I really uh, mean that sincerely. Um, it's not often that I get to come out and, and get so uh, much information about all the things that are great going on out there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit differently from the panel this morning. Um, uh, to give you my perspective on what we're dealing with in the Pentagon, the, the two sides of the Pentagon, Bob. Um, uh, I'm in the inside. <laughs> um, let me what start. What do you do with your spare time? I know. <laughs> Um, let me start. Um, one of the things Secretary Mattis has been quoted famously as saying, the department should be prepared to mitigate any consequences of a changing climate, including ensuring that our shipyards and installations will continue to function as required. Um, I want to point out a few things about that. First of all, my staff actually wrote that. Um, <laughs> Good. But <laughs> um, there's a little funny story about that, and I'll, uh, I will take the time to say it. So um, uh, the administration was very uh, uh, focused on getting uh, Secretary Mattis confirmed the day of the inauguration. So he had his confirmation hearing, and, we, and if any of you have been through this process, you have to have the questions for the record completed before the committee will vote on you. So the questions for the record came the weekend before, which was, of course, a holiday weekend. And we're scrambling because we have these questions about climate change, but we have no direction yet on what we should, in fact, say. So we wrote very wishy-washy answers, um, which general counsel then made even more wishy-washy. Um, and they got submitted to Secretary Mattis's team that was working with him, General Mattis's team. And they came back to us and said, these are too weak. Secretary Mattis believes in climate change and the risks to national security. You need to make them stronger. We're like, oh, okay, we'll do that. So, um, but the other point I want to make out is, uh, is these were prior to his confirmation, he made these statements. Um, we're still kind of looking for his direction right now, post-confirmation in some of these areas. However, we, there are some other things that have been going on, so to set the stage. Now, on October 5th, the Secretary issued his memo of what he considers the priorities for the Department of Defense. And I felt it was important to share those with you, and I'm going to walk through them a little bit later. His first is restore military readiness as we build a more lethal force. Second, strengthen alliances and attract new partners. <coughs> And third, bring business reforms to the Department of Defense. And with that, he's talking about budget discipline, effective resource management. So we have that direction from him. Those are his three priorities. He's been very clear and articulate that that's what we have to work on. Then the second is, in March, President Trump signed Executive Order 13783, promoting energy independence and economic growth. And if you're familiar with all the presidential executive orders, I know they're my lifeline. I don't know if they were all yours. Um, he was, the president clearly withdrew previous uh, presidential executive orders related to climate change and various presidential memorandums. Um, with focus on n in not moving what were perceived as impediments to energy development. Now, buried in that executive order is a requirement for all the federal agencies to look at their policies on climate, uh, review them, and make a decision to uh, suspend, revise, or rescind. And so we have that context. And then Executive Order 13807, which I'm sorry, I didn't write down the title for, actually revoked an earlier executive order on uh, floodplain risk. So where does that leave DOD? So we have Secretary Mattis's three priorities. We have the President's direction on climate change. Um, so where do we go? So my then is to step back and say, OK, we have the President's prior the Secretary's priorities. How do we fit this world of a changing climate, of this need and interest in resilience into those three priorities. And I think that's fairly easy. So let's start with restore military readiness. Uh, for those that saw the film last night, you know, it talks about the availability of assets, for your peers, roads, electrical infrastructure, a less stressed workforce. Well, 
I can argue that having resilience built in to any of those things, whether it be our training ranges, um, our roads, our piers, our electrical infrastructure, if we're looking at those future stressors at the changing climate that, and we're enabling those resources and assets to be available for the training and readiness of our force to be more available and more lethal. So I, I see a link there. The second one was uh, strengthening alliances. Now, Secretary Mattis is probably talking internationally uh, about alliances, but we need strong alliances in the United States around our bases. And as uh, the Colonel said uh, earlier in his slide, he showed we're not an island. Um, that's really important. Remember, most of our service members and their families actually live off base. We're dependent on that. So we need to work together in a strong, with a strong community. A strong community means a strong, vital, uh, strong and vital installation. So how can we work together on those risks that are coming towards us, those threats to, to all of our needs um, related to climate and making sure that we're good, strong partners? Now, I know we had the Old Dominion-led uh, partnership effort here. We had a similar partnership with the state of Michigan and one in um, Idaho, we're going to look at the lessons learned from those three uh, pilots to see how can we develop more guidance out to all of the installations to say, how do you partner with the surrounding communities in a way that is productive um, and meaningful to all of us when we're addressing all of these climate risks so that we are strong and, uh, and vital and we strengthen those um, alliances. The third, bring, bring home, uh, bring business reform. So we're, we're making smarter investment decisions. So I can also bring that to climate resilience. So as we're investing in infrastructure, in our military construction programs, our various other sustainment programs, are we making those decisions for the long-term sustainability of those assets? Are we thinking strategically about the risks and threats associated with them? And I do want to point out, although the um, President did revoke the executive order on uh, floodplain risk management, the DOD policy still requires for every military construction project comes forward that uh, the uh, service actually certified that they took into consideration if they are in a floodplain, that the risks associated with that and have appropriately addressed those risks. Because look, at we're in when we make an investment in an infrastructure now, we're gonna have that infrastructure for for decades and decades, and as the historic preservation officer, I can tell you, it could be centuries. Um, you know, how long have we? I'm going to go to New England. Sorry, how long have we had Portsmouth Naval Shipyard um, as a shipyard? Uh, the 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 dry docks there it date from the late 1800s, and they're still with us and still vital today. So, I think there's good news here. Um, uh, uh, so we had the instruction from the pre from the president to review revise uh, to review our policies on climate adaptation and resilience. Um, we're doing that right now, and we have a choice. We can uh, suspend, revise, or revoke. And I can tell you that we are moving towards the revise. And the revise, and and it's important that I've gotten the political leadership, the current political leadership, to talk about this, and they're focused on. The basic structure we had in the DOD policy on climate change adaptation and resilience is right. They've tweaked some of the words. We now say a changing climate instead of climate change. <laughs> they felt they did something. That's good. There's more focus on resilience, uh, which I think is appro appropriate, but the fundamentals stay the same. The same general policies that this is a risk that we need to integrate into day-to-day decision-making. The responsibilities stay the same. The responsibilities for my office, the responsibilities of the military departments, the responsibilities of the combatant commands, the responsibility of the joint staff, they stay the same. So I think that's an indication that the department sees that the long-term uh, risk um, uh, to our ability to perform our mission uh, from, resulting from a changing climate, I have to adopt the language, is in fact something that we have to intact, um, uh, prepare for. 
I think we have a long track record in the Department of Defense of recognizing risks um, and, and addressing them and we, as we do our planning and preparing for any national security issue, our missions. Climate impacts are no different. DOD is going to continue to focus on the resiliency of our installations, on our infrastructure, on our training ranges to meet our mission needs. This climate is another risk that we have to and must address based on all the great information that comes from, uh, from Dave's uh, uh, colleagues in the, in the Navy uh, Oceanographer's Office. But let me go back to remember the Secretary Mattis's three priorities. And I do strongly believe that we can, in fact, make strong ties to building resilience to a changing climate, restore military readiness, strengthen our alliances, and bring business reforms to the Department of Defense. So thank you all, um, and I appreciate being uh, involved in today's discussion. Maureen, thank you very much. Those most timely and accurate comments, we appreciate it. <laughs> So I'll try to keep this within seven minutes, plus or minus. Uh, and I also would like to extend my thanks to William and Mary for the invitation. Uh, it's always fun to actually do a panel with uh, colleagues who you both like and respect. And I can say that about Admiral Phillips, General Barnes, and, uh, and Ms. Sullivan. So this is actually a lot of fun. So we talked about inside, outside the Pentagon. So I came down from Penn State last afternoon. And if you look at Google, it says go right around the Beltway. But the chances of getting sucked into the Pentagon are far too great. So I actually came through uh, West Virginia and, and Winchester. And I can tell you, if you keep about 80 kilometers between the Beltway and, and you, the, the, the force sucking you in back in isn't too bad. So that worked out OK. All right, I'm just going to go through very quickly, you know, why do we care? Uh, there are no polar bears here. Uh, there are no trees to hug on here. Uh, but we care about, and I can still say climate change. I love not being in the government. Uh, it's because of three things, people, water, and change. It's really just that simple. It's people, water, change. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the people right now because I only have seven minutes. Uh, but we are here talking about the water. Too much, too little, wrong place, wrong time. Salty where it used to be fresh, wet where it used to be dry, uh, liquid where it used to be solid, and actually the chemistry of the ocean is changing too. We care about that wet where it used to be dry, which is linked to the liquid where it used to be solid because the ice is melting off the land. Uh, as you all know here, Hampton Roads is kind of in a hot spot for, uh, for sea level rise. Yes, there is subsidence. Yes, there is the Gulf Stream slowing down, also due to climate change. Uh, but the big picture, is how much ice comes off Greenland and Antarctica. That's really going to drive what kind of issue you guys have. Uh, subsidence, roughly one foot per year, very roughly one foot per year. When we start looking at uh, the sea level rise, that could be five, six, seven feet per year. So keep your eye on the ball on, on what's really driving this. Uh, Maureen and I did not uh, coordinate our slides. This is actually a slide I gave to a conference Admiral Greenert when he was Chief of Naval Operations sponsored. Uh, we do up at uh, Newport about every two years, we basically gather every head of Navy who will talk to the United States. Back then it was 70. I don't know what it'll be this time. Uh, but it was 70 heads of navies. And, and Admiral Greenert asked me to do a half day on the maritime risks of climate change. Uh, and this is a slide I used, and you can see impacts to bases or infrastructure. It's a readiness issue, which happens to line up very, very nicely with uh, Secretary Mattis's number one priority. So if you're trying to increase readiness, you probably want to work on things that will degrade readiness and stop that from, from the degradation. So this really, really fits in very nicely, although this slide is now almost three years old with, with what he was talking about. A little of this has come up uh, already today. Uh, everybody loves the, the Hampton Roads, you know, Isabel. evacuate from, yeah, Isabel, the ice storms. I hate ice storms. Uh, and, and that's what happens. But many of you here, more than my usual talks, know this is Diego Garcia on the far left, uh, arguably the most strategic island that the public has never heard about, and uh, one to two meters above sea level. So I asked uh, Maureen's former boss, it's like, so what is the exact effective rate of sea level rise 
on Diego Garcia? And the answer was, yeah, that's a really good question. We should probably figure that out. I'm sure Maureen's working on that. So, I mean, because this is, you know, if you take out, I mean, I see a whole lot of people in uniform or people who were in uniform. Imagine, you know, a day in the life of the Pentagon in Southwest Asia without Diego Garcia, whatever service you're in. Uh, yeah, it gets pretty interesting. Uh, the one on the right, I'm sorry, Air Force, uh, that's Kwajalein. Space fence, great idea, we need to do it. Billion dollar radar, environmental impact study, this thick, what do they not look at? Sea level rise. Why? You know, how many decades did Marines say all this stuff's gonna last? Well, it won't last as long if you don't think about that. So it's not just Hampton Roads. Uh, the other thing that's probably good for the Department of Defense to remember is when the Department of Defense finally gets focused on this, they will not be the only ones with their tin cup coming to Washington. This is how many people, roughly, red is a lot, blue is not so many, live within about three feet of sea level, of, of high tide today. Uh, and you can just kind of go through all the communities where there are those yellows and reds. They are going to be lobbying their congressional delegation for various mitigation and, uh, and relief strategies. So the DOD, it's like it's gonna, like gonna be going to the barber shop on Saturday morning. Take a number because there's a lot of other people who at about the same time will figure this out. Remember all these financial crises we've had? You know, when all the correlations go to one, people in business school, there's gotta be somebody in the business school here. Uh, this is kind of what's gonna happen to us. You know, we can usually deal with onesies, twosies when they don't all happen at the same time. As the seas come up, pretty much all of our coastal infrastructure is going to realize the effects. There will be different effects in different places, but they're all gonna be suffering and they're all gonna end up coming to Washington because I'll tell you, the states are gonna say, geez, we just don't have enough money. So that's gonna be an issue as well. Okay, back on my business kick. Everybody know this guy or heard of this guy? So one of his, you know, if, if you could read one business thing, this is probably a good one to read, but uh, one of his more famous sayings is begin with the end in mind. So when I hear about mitigation, whether it's in Hampton Roads or Mayport or other places, it's like, to what end are we really building and designing for? And are we really thinking about that? We hear a lot about 2100. I hate to tell people, but the ice did not get the memo that it's supposed to stop melting in the year 2100. We are not at equalization at that point. So here's from Climate Central, and these are reasonable numbers. If you stabilize the climate at four degrees Celsius, which would be kind of business as usual, Paris gets us to three degrees if everybody did what they said they were gonna do in Paris. So four is not unreasonable. All that blue is underwater. And you can see where Norfolk is. Uh, Norfolk's you know, now about three miles out to sea. Okay, that's a big seawall. That's a really, really big seawall. But let's say we figure this stuff out. Two degrees, which is gonna be hard, but it's achievable. There are some islands left in the Hampton Roads area. There's still a lot that's underwater. This is when you stabilize, okay? This is not 2100, this is when you stabilize. And every piece of science we get keeps saying that stuff is actually kind of worse than what we had thought a few, few years ago. There's one degree, we can kind of deal with that. That's about two meters, although the Army Corps studies show that two meters is already significant for the Norfolk Naval Base and some of the other big DOD installations. So let me just sort of play as an animation here. You can, whoops, sorry. You can kind of see how this works, but you can see that two degrees, 15 feet, is really, really serious for Norfolk. So we don't have to say, oh my God, well this is like Armageddon and your gloom and doom. This is two degrees is not unreasonable. We're at one already. So two degrees is hard. So we need to think about what can we do, what should we do. I would argue that one of the things, if you care about Norfolk and Hampton Roads, you would do is you would want to do carbon mitigation. And this is not to save polar bears, this is not to hug trees, this is not to make your eco-warrior friends happy. It's for self-preservation. Because the less you can have for global temperature rise, you have a much better chance of keeping most or at least some of the Hampton Roads area intact. This is risk management. 
And I can tell you on the change part, the sea level and the climate will change for all of your lives, your children's lives, and probably your grandchildren's lives. So we are done with stability and change is what we will have. So whether you're building, whether you're doing policies, you're gonna to have to remember that. Different ways to do this, and I'm sure you know, there are many people who study these, you know, and we've already talked about some of these uh, today. The episodic, that's like storm surges. Chronic, that's every day. You know, and at what cost? And you gotta remember this is a community issue, and that's been brought up many times already. I'll just close here. Uh, I would not call either Admiral Nimitz or Secretary Schultz uh, tree huggers, uh, but I think they had some pretty, pretty useful comments there. Admiral Nimitz talking about nothing more dangerous than to be grudging, taking precautions. It was actually in response to, he was somewhat unhappy that Admiral Halsey kept running his battle group through typhoons. Uh, that didn't work out so well. Uh, and Secretary Schultz, of course, has talked about this in the form of an insurance policy. So. It's really good that we're thinking about like raising the piers by a foot or two feet and things like that. That's wonderful. You need to do that near term, but begin with the end in mind. What are we building to and how are we going to make sure that we don't have that kind of catastrophic 30 feet? And that does require Hampton Roads and everybody else, regardless of political beliefs, to participate in how do we reduce carbon emissions because that's the name of the game. Thanks very much. words of cheer. So I hope everybody uh, really internalizes that. So my purpose on this is to talk about, um, from a DOD perspective, whether DOD has really the authorities it needs to really effectively partner with local communities and regions and states to address this problem as society as a whole tries to get a handle on, on what Dave mentioned is the real solution. So I start out by saying, okay, let's step back and think about a possible framework to think about all of this. Uh, and in my own mind, it helps me to divide the assets that DOD needs into three categories. One is the one you're all familiar with. It's bases, it's people, it's uh, equipment and ships, money that's appropriated to the Department of Defense. That's assets that are fully managed by Department of Defense. But there are two other categories of assets critical to Department of Defense. Category two is some national assets that are co-managed by other federal agencies, like frequency spectrum, airspace, certain sea, uh, sea training ranges. Category three is really where the rubber hits the road in the context we're talking about. And that is, you know, as the Colonel said, DOD is not an island. It is absolutely not an island because this category three, assets that DOD does not normally manage, be it the industrial base, transportation, external energy, et cetera, et cetera. It's an absolutely critical, essential asset for the Department of Defense. So addressing what we're talking about today has to involve action in all of these categories, category one and category three in particular. So let's, let's uh, talk about uh, existing DOD authorities, which are extensive. Okay, assets categories one and two, that is to say all the stuff that DOD manages and plus co-manages with other federal agencies, extensive in both law and regulation. Exercised through exhaustive budgetary requirements building, management structures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Asset category three is different. It's fairly broad in the context of getting together and having discussions like this, going to uh, community meetings, zoning boards, uh, doing planning together. A lot of restrictions on that. You don't see a lot of DOD people voting at the zoning board member. Uh, but nonetheless, and that's very useful, it's essential. It's a groundwork for everything else. But there's a lot of other DOD authorities. And historically, and I'll go through this a little bit, these DOD authorities for this category, these non-DOD assets, 
were nearly all in response to a problem demonstrating that the existing authorities were inadequate. Let's start with the Defense Production Act. That's a Korean War statute passed in 1950. Because of President Truman's concerns and others, that DOD did not have an adequate access to the industrial base of the United States to get the war materials it needed. So it passed a broad statute, which still exists today, allowing DOD to engage with the industrial base and, for example, require industrial suppliers to meet DOD's needs before they meet other people's needs. Um, that authority is out there. In fact, it's used recently to do a lot of funding for biofuels with Department of Agriculture. De Defense Production Act was the authority for that. It is coming up for reauthorization in 2019, by the way, and I'll get to that. Now, there are several limited authorities uh, where DOD can actually have some skin in the game with the partners, that is, pr put in resources beyond time, thought, and energy, i.e., dollars. And one of those authorities is being used in this context right now. The Office of Economic Adjustment, which runs the Joint Land Use Study Program, has provided money to, with communities to do joint planning to deal with this kind of thing. And I think you'll hear about that a little later today. A lot of people don't think about impact aid to local schools as being in this category, but in fact it is. Here is authority for DOD to provide some funding to local schools that are impacted by DOD bases and that are necessary to educate DOD kids. That's this kind of thing. A really interesting one is called the Defense Access Roads Program. And that's in Department of Transportation's authority title of, of, of the U.S. Code. And that's where DOD makes a change to a base through BRAC or opening up a new uh, or closing an existing gate. DOD can actually provide money through the Department of Transportation to local transportation authorities to fund, partially fund, the road work necessary to accommodate the impact of those changes on the local community. Um, now, there are several tailored authorities to form really funded public-private partnerships. And I want to spend a little time on the one, the REPI program mainly because I've worked for, <laughs> with it for a long time. Um, that's Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program. And what is that? This is another authority that was in response to a challenge where it was demonstrated that DOD didn't have enough authority to deal with it, and that's encroachment. Incompatible development coming in close to the bases, loss of habitat, which puts DOD as sort of the zoo protecting endangered species, limiting their authorities. It took a crisis back in the 90s where restrictions under the Endangered Species Act almost shut down the training for the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg to really drive home that, hey, DOD needs to be able to do something beyond the joint land use study, beyond talking to the local people. They needed to actually have something that gives them skin in a game and a public-private partnership to deal with this. So this program authorizes DOD in conjunction with state, local governments, NGOs to go out and co-fund the protection of land in the vicinity of DOD installations or airspace to preserve habitat or pre prevent encroachment. Okay? It started small in reaction to this problem, but by now over $1 billion has been spent in almost 90 installations to protect a half a million acres of land to keep DOD protected from these outside influences that were hurting the military. Um, there's also a, an authority to manage off-post habitat. Use DOD dollars to manage off-post habitat in certain circumstances. That authority can be used, for example, to help restore wetlands where the wetlands would serve as an, a barrier to intrusion on a DOD installation. Okay, but those are great, but are they adequate? Uh, in a word, no. I don't think so. In case of uh, Category 1 authorities, thank you, uh, DOD really needs to look outside the fence line. 
and extend their ex extreme detailed planning process for stuff inside the fence line to really take account of what's going outside the fence line. And why do I say that? Because it's this process that ties those situations to the budget and requirement process within Department of Defense. In case of Category 3 assets, I think there are additional authorities, maybe based like the REPI statute, but other options listed up on the slide to do that. I think the Defense Production Act coming up from reauthorization in 2019 is a very interesting authority to take a look at that. Okay. So, as in other historical examples, there is a time lag between the problem, the realization of the authorities needed, granting the authorities, and then working to get the funding. That can be a very long process. I think it's time to start. There was some mention of what was in the uh, House bill, the Langevin Amendment. Um, I thought just for grins that I would copy some of the relevant language from that amendment. Now, what does this demonstrate? This demonstrates that this problem is beginning to be socialized in the Congress. There was an effort to strip this out of the bill, and as mentioned before, we had a whole bunch of Republicans, 46 I think by memory, that voted against the amendment to strip this out of the House bill. It's in there. Now, it's just the House bill. We've got to go to conference and get the final conference bill. But take a look at some of those things that this provision would require Department of Defense to look at and report back to Congress. Congress is starting to really think about the problem and how it affects Department of Defense and what is necessary to be done. Well, the Senate's done something similar, too, in its report language on the bill. This is from the SASC report on their mark. Again, I'm not going to read through here. You can read faster than I can talk. But I highlighted and read a couple things that I thought were particularly pertinent to this discussion. Opportunities to pursue public-private partnerships under existing authorities with any non-DOD entity. Strategies and recommendations to alleviate climate vulnerabilities, including timelines and critical language resource requirements. My information from folks up on the Hill is that some merged version of these two is going to be in the final Defense Authorization Act and that Congress will be looking for Department of Defense to come back and say, okay, what's the situation? What are you, what are you doing about it? What's your strategy? And that's part of this long socialization process that has happened every time in the past when there was an external problem that required DOD to interface with non-DOD communities and industries, facilities, the recognition of not enough authority, the enactment of the authority, the gradual building of budgetary and requirements to do that authority. And I think that is a critical step that is already started, needs to continue with your support and that of your delegations to really give DOD the authority it needs to effectively partner in a whole of government context with local communities so everybody's got skin in the game and can put the resources they can gather to addressing this problem. Thank you very much. General Barnes, you, you talked about um ways to better, inter better, better interact between federal, state, and local agencies and communities. And you mentioned the JLUS program, but my understanding of joint land use study program is a little, it's outside the requirements process. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's part of the problem. A lot of these authorities like, I mean, it, it gets funding from Congress right. through the Office of Economic Opportunity, but a lot of these existing authorities are precisely that. They're outside of the budget and requirement system including that REPI program that I talked about. that has been so successful, but it's kind of ad hoc. It's not really plugged in to the whole detailed, establish the requirements, build a budget, et cetera, et cetera. And that really needs to happen. In fact, all these external action things that are going on now are really not tied specifically to a requirements process. There's sort of general categories. Here's some certain money that you can use to go out and talk to your neighbors. 
and that kind of, but it's not really built into the requirements process. And if there's ever going to be serious DOD funding to have skin in the game and resilience processes, it needs to be built into the requirements process. I think the simplest way is to extend instrumentation master planning outside the fence line and stop pretending that you can successfully plan for an installation without addressing the conditions outside your fence line because there's a lot of assumption of stability built into the installation master planning process that is just not accurate. In other words, they assume that the external conditions are going to remain stable. If you really want to plug in for resources, you've got to plug it into that process. Do we have a question? I was going to say good morning. Yes, I do have a question. Okay. When I, it's exactly what the last gentleman was just talking about, and category three and what you just said about outside the fence line. I think I still understand that the defense budget, uh, meaning the military departments, pay the cost of defending their own bases out to the fence line. In, in the kind of projects we're talking about, that's where it meets the cores of engineers' civil works program currently. The civil works program, last I knew, was 65% uh, budgets coming out of the Water Resources Development Bill and 35% from the non-federal sponsor. Uh, getting the Defense Department to help the non-federal sponsor with that 35%, it seems to me, would move those projects, a lot of them forward, that just linger. Is that generally still true, and is that the, uh, an appropriate approach? Well, we have the expert over here from the, the committee. I, I think the, the cost share does vary depending on the authority you're acting under, but um, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that, that's an interesting approach. I mean, DOD now does not have the authority to do that, okay? Should DOD have a very tightly written authority to participate in providing funds for water resource pro uh, projects that would add to the resilience of the military installation. You can make a case for that, okay? In the REPI program, for example, dollars coming from Department of Defense to its partners, NGOs, local communities, et cetera, et cetera, can be used by those partners as part of matching funds for other federal programs along the lines that you were suggesting in the core context, okay? And I should say, the, the, again, going back to this REPI authority, which may be a model, may not, um, it was first enacted in 2001 or two. The problem had existed for 20 years or more. It really started to, bright, to bite directly on readiness in the mid-90s. It took Congress five or six years to pass a statute. Initially, it was low, low funded. Now it gets about $75 million a year, okay? Congress is almost every year, thanks Nick Barbash, you're in here somewhere, um, add funds to the, to the request from the department for that. Um, so yeah, it could do that, but let me throw in a caution I should have included in my base talk. The best way to kill this effort is for people to look at DOD as the big cash cow. Because, yeah, there's a lot of money, $600 billion a year, but DOD has $800 billion a year in bills, 200 of which they don't pay. Deferred maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is not a lot of spare cash in Department of Defense, I guarantee you that. So you really got to make the case to compete in a time of scarce resources, and that takes time, that takes political energy, it takes huge support from local communities and states through their congressional delegations, okay, and growing appreciation by the experts within the Department of Defense and better data to make that case. It's not a quick process. I'll just, for less than a minute, comment on that, because that's kind of my begin with the end in mind, because you got to get focused, not you personally, but the Congress, we as a nation have to decide, are we actually going to address this? And if we are, then we can figure out how to do it. And there's a number of different ways. 
But otherwise, the analogy is for anybody who's worked Arctic, Arctic related issues, you know, look at the silliness we've had for over a decade now trying to recapitalize icebreakers. Uh, it's, it's sort of bounced back and forth between the Coast Guard and the Department of Defense. Everybody kind of agrees. It was not in the previous administration's president's budgets until there was a little tiny bit of money, about 100 million or so, at their very last, as they're, close, as they're shutting the lights off. And they, and they mucked about with it for their entire eight years. Uh, everybody knew these things were breaking. Everybody knew eventually you're gonna have to do it. There was no focus. And right now, that's where we are for a lot of these. We all kind of see, yeah, someday it's gonna be an issue, but we don't address it. And, and General Barnes is exactly right. I mean, everybody looks at the DOD as like, oh, they'll find money, and they won't, because there isn't, it, it isn't there. And uh, this is where we're gonna have to, unfortunately, have a discussion about priorities within our nation, and are we gonna deal with this, or are we just simply gonna react, and we're gonna find that the naval base is in Yorktown, because that's the nearest piece of dry land. But let me just reemphasize historically, all those examples and others I could give. Problem exists for a long time. Finally, the two by four hits the jackass in the middle of the forehead. And the problem is focused upon. Authority is created. Inertia keeps the authority from being used for some time. Budget tight. That's an evolutionary process, okay? And some of us are trying to be a bit of a two by four here, okay? <laughs> Uh, not in this audience, everybody in here gets it, but others that don't, for that process to get going. But that's not a next year we're home base. That's a next year we make progress. The year after that, we make some more progress. The year after that, we make some more progress. The Repi statute's been amended eight times since it was passed only 13, 14 years ago. As it, new problems came up, new issues had to be addressed, Things we didn't anticipate surfaced. The same is gonna happen here if focus is there. I have a, a quick question uh, for Ms. Sullivan. I think there's some more. From, Jason, you gonna, do you have a question? question. Okay, go ahead. So, I, uh, well, first of all, the panelists, thank you. Uh, I've got a lot of notes that I've taken from this <laughs> actual panel, so very good. Uh, my question, though, is for uh, General Barnes, sir, and I, I will admit I'm uh, commanding the Norfolk District, so I'm admittedly biased uh, okay. in terms of what the Corps offers or can do, but I noticed in the construct of Category 3, you didn't speak to the Corps as it pertains, and the question here regarding the civil work sort of got after it, but I'd be interested in, in your thoughts and expanding upon uh, the, the logic behind that, and, and then I'd offer that I think that what's happening right now with the Norfolk Coastal Storm Risk Management Study attempts to do exactly what's happening in Category 3 and operating yeah. outside of, of, of the yeah. fence line. Yeah, first of all, I love the Corps. Uh, my dad was a <laughs> career Corps of Engineer Officer. I'm a Corps baby, so I, and I've worked on Corps issues with the Nature Conservancy and elsewhere, various word of acts, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a lot of people don't understand that, that the Corps Civil Works and then, but the real heart of the core mission is engineering support to the active forces in their combat mission, right? Inside the fence line here or in Afghanistan or in Europe or wherever else. And that's the DOD funded part of the core, okay? And that, a lot of that is happening inside the fence line. It's, it's vertical, horizontal construction, et cetera, et cetera, funded through the DOD budget, executed by the Corps of Engineers, great. But that's a category one thing, okay? But the Corps in its civil works hat, right, and there's very interesting history all the way back to 1803 on why the Corps of Engineers is not a civilian agency but part of the Department of Defense. Um, that's a different deal. The Department of Defense cannot be a non-federal sponsor for the Corps, okay, under existing law. It can't partner with and provide funds to other state and local things as non-federal sponsors, as astutely recommended there, for that work outside the fence line, okay? Because right now, the DOD part of the Corps of Engineers really doesn't have any authority to go out, you know, 10 miles away from the base and help restore a wetland using DOD money. So that, that's really the split. 
or f or fix an access fix an access road, road etc and by the way the defense access road program as it's currently written you can't use it to help Hampton Boulevard from flooding because it's not tied to a change in as described in the statute you could amend it so you could do that it's one of the things I think should be done but there you go one more question. Or I just have a one minute, Paul. <laughs> quick, simple question. So <laughs> each of you have spoken a lot about the interaction uh, between the military and civilian communities, capabilities, and so forth. And General Barnes pointed out that you, know, you have to have a requirement for the government or the DOD to buy something, which was actually what brought me here, right? Uh, TRADOC was here. They established the requirements. So the question really is given that there's this growing number of studies that DOD is doing, for example, that show these interactions, especially in the Tidewater area. On the, the state side, you know, states are looking at resilience and what does it take to be resilient in the state. Communities look at their uh, needs. Utilities look at their needs. So how can we uh, find ways to share that information and to actually influence those decisions so that the utility makes decisions about their undergrounding, about their uh, network composition that take into account military capabilities. How do we uh, allow the military to uh, participate in the sort of exposing these needs and helping to define the value proposition for some of these decisions that don't necessarily take the investment on the other part, they just inform the decisions among those other agencies or internally? I'll, I'll take that one um, because uh, I can't talk to the money thing uh, just to say that the um, for our, our internal infrastructure the sustainment we're investing right now at about 60 percent of the requirement uh, just to stay to sustain but I think you Paul you have an excellent point and that was one of the things that um, we did these pilots uh, uh, across the nation here in Hampton Roads, one in Michigan and one in Idaho, to start exploring that that concept of how we can have, and it's a variation actually on, on Bob's point of extending master planning off the base, of having those dialogues about where those link ups are and how that communication. I think we have not given our installations the tool sets to be able to have those discussions and there's a gap there that can in fact be filled because there is a lot of information that has to go back and forth. I, I'm also gonna say, you know, next week I'm going to speak to the Association of Defense Communities and um, I, I wanna, as much as I understand Bob says, you know, us money helping them, the communities have a role to make sure that, that, the that the community is valuable to the installation, that it is worth keeping that installation in that community and they're going to make the investments. And I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, what came out of the pilot project in Mountain Home, Idaho is the state actually bought water rights for the Air Force Base because they knew if the Air Force Base ran out of water, that it would be high on the closure list. If we don't have water, we cannot function. So I, it's got to be a partnership in those discussions. Um, I, so I would caution you to say that defense dollars are not going to be the total solution. I think it has to be a partnership. But absolutely sharing information up front and having those discussions is the foundation of that. Yeah, and I know both of these generals are, uh, right. general <laughs> officers are going to comment on my uh, remarks. Just, uh, let, me, let me just uh, tag on to that a little bit, okay? Because absolutely DOD has the authority it needs to pass on this kind of information absent security concerns. I mean, classified yeah. information. For, but they've got a system to do it, okay? Not really. Um, one of the things that preceded the REPI program still there is, is the ACUS program, great acronym, Air Installation Compatibility Use Zone program. And it was a rigorous and comprehensive program to pass to local planning communities, et cetera, et cetera, information about the impacts of, on DOD of certain decisions about where things are built in clear zones and places where planes tend to crash and stuff like that or not building up a you know 400 foot tower during in the approach pattern for the a fighter jet and a base but that was organized that was funded there were staff responsible for it there were parameters for engagement etc cetera, etc cetera. 
nothing like that exists yet in this area and, and needs to as part of the better use of existing authorities. I'll just very, very quickly, I know we're out of time here. One of, it's necessary but not sufficient, but one of the things that would really help in this information sharing is having basically authoritative climate services. And by authoritative, I mean the government has its stamp on it and that's what everybody uses. So the analogy is like for the hurricane service, you can argue whether or not the hurricane service, I think they're very good, is the best or not. But by God, if they put out a warning, whether it's the DOD, whether it's civilian, whether it's everybody, that's the warning and we all do something. Uh, we do not have that for climate. Everybody has their own set of data. You want a small number, I'll give you a small number. You want a big one, I'll give you a big one. Uh, you will, and, and it becomes very hard for different places that already are gonna have a, a, a significant uh, work to do to really establish trust. If we can't even have a common baseline on which to start that for what is the threat, the climate threat in the future, sea level rise, whatever, uh, it gets, it's just really hard to get off of first base. Again, that will not by itself solve this, but that would be really helpful. Uh, Noah tried to do this seven years ago. They were politically, the kindest word I can say is naive, uh, and that has set this work back a generation. Uh, there's no near-term prospect of this really happening, but at some point we're gonna get there, and we gotta have a common base work, uh, framework on, on which to work these challenges. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm not threatening to close the bases around Norfolk. I, 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 please don't, don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. <laughs> well, and you're going to hear more about some of these collaborative things that are going on and some new things that are started later on this afternoon in some of those panels. Um, but I would offer that um, this region has a real opportunity because of our huge federal presence to leverage that as justification for why we should be getting attention and why we earn and deserve that attention. But in order to do that, we have to have our own plan too. And that has to be done regionally and it has to be done collaboratively. And so in case, in, until we do that, and unless or until we do that, um, we're at risk because we, we look vulnerable. Um, and in fact, we are vulnerable. It's just a matter of whether we prepare for it. We've also talked about the IPP project a couple of times this morning. Some of you know all about it. You were a part of it. Many of you were, but many of you may not have been. Um, that project was never outbriefed publicly here in the region, but it is available publicly. Um, if you look at www.floodingresiliency.org, uh, that's the website for the Center for uh, Recurrent Flooding Resiliency, Commonwealth Center for Recurrent Flooding Resiliency, and you search for IPP Phase two report, you will find the pilot project and all of the appendixes that go with it. Some great information. If you haven't seen it or you're not familiar with it, take a look. Thank you very much to our distinguished panel this morning, uh, Ms. Sullivan, Dr. Titley, and General Barnes. Very much appreciate you all traveling great distances to be here and taking out of your time out of your very busy schedules to uh, provide us some really candid comments. So thank you to all of you, and thank you to our, uh, our audience, and I think it's time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>